Good evening and welcome to the QI Academy presentations. I am Joyce and I am the Education Program Manager here at Qualcomm Institute. Tonight's student presentations are the work of two quarters of research with esteemed QI mentors. And the presentations are 15 minutes each followed by five minutes of Q&A. And we ask that you keep your questions to that part. And we're also doing Q&A a little bit differently in this webinar. If you look to the bottom of the screen, there is a raise hand function. And during the Q&A portion, you can raise your hand or click on that button and you will be allowed to ask your question through your own mic. And now I'd like to hand it off to the person that brings this all together, our instructor, Dr. Leanne Shukoski. And Leanne, I think you're still on mute. Can't hear you. We can't hear you. Can anyone hear me? No, okay. I saw a, a message flash by which said that the host had muted all participants. Yeah, it's a bit strange that Leanne, we can't hear you. Um, would you consider taking out your mic, your um, your phones to see if that would work? Can you, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Perfect. Okay, I just can't hear you. Oh. So, uh, let's see. One year now piece. There we go. Oh. Okay, interesting. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. You know, we should have this down by now, particularly in this class, because all of you um, have, for the first quarter, worked with me through um, some, some really, hopefully, interesting to you lessons. But, but they were geared to prepare you for the research that you were engaging over these two quarters. Little did we know when we started that this research would be remote and that you'd be presenting it remotely, but I am um, really impressed by how well you have pivoted, how well you have dealt with this challenge and continue to engage. And I've been particularly excited to hear from so many of you that um, this was something that was really a highlight of your spring quarter because you were working in small groups together to accomplish something that was meaningful in the world. And so um, without further ado, I, I want to uh, introduce the, the director of the Qualcomm Institute, Ramesh Rao, who has actually made this possible and um, wants to keep this kind of course to be a showpiece of what we do in an educational uh, capacity here at QI. So Ramesh. Uh, thank you, Leanne. Uh, thank you for having me uh, join you at this point in the program. Uh, I did want to start by uh, drawing attention to the fact that we are living through difficult times. I don't underestimate uh, the complexity of what we are confronting, both the pandemic uh, as well as uh, the social fabric and the stress that it is under. Uh, it can't be easy for anybody. It hasn't been easy for me, but it's also a moment to learn, uh, to make sense of things that we perhaps have taken for granted uh, in take a look at it in a new way. Uh, but uh, I too am excited uh, doubly because uh, uh, this uh, program, the academic internship program uh, that Dr. Chikaski has been running uh, is our e effort as an institute to get involved with the teaching mission. Uh, in particular, uh, we had the seventh college, we have the seventh college in mind, 
and now the eighth college plans are also underway and so interdisciplinary student projects is something that campus is uh, very much uh, wanting to uh, broaden uh, to give opportunities and through my own involvement with the two teams that I was directly working as a mentor for both last uh, a couple of terms and this one it's been wonderful to see the quality uh, uh, the creativity that emerges uh, so I look forward very much. I want to thank uh, everybody involved in doing this. Uh, Leanne is not only serving as the instructor, she's the thought leader behind this, uh, conceiving of the program, doing it in this manner. Uh, and it's just wonderful to see how the juxtaposition of the uh, formal material that uh, gets covered through the Minerva platform and the specific projects that are unfolding uh, reinforce each other syn uh, synergistically. So, Without further ado, I want to sit back and uh, uh, witness uh, the work that you've done. Wonderful. Yeah. So, so we're going to start with the first project. And on the way, I'm going to be mentioning people who are involved, in particular the mentors. But I want you to, those of you who can stay till the end, you're going to get a chance to meet the course assistants who've been helping along the way. These are a graduate student, Nicole Suarez, and two um, undergraduate and, and uh, recent postgrads uh, from Minerva who have learned to work in this sort of online platform and have sort of scaffolded our ability to teach and um, um, prepare students for this research that you'll be hearing. So our first group um, has been working with Trish Stone, who is a QI staff and actually the lead of our, um, the curator of our gallery that we hope to all get back to and see what's going on in there very soon. Um, she has been leading a group um, in a very timely project that I'll let them introduce to you but in a, in a creative way using a topic that we talked about in uh, our last unit of the course um, called Complex Systems, using this agent-based modeling to create a method for thinking about how uh, humans respond to the COVID pandemic. So I'd like the, the first group to um, prepare their presentation. This would be Yixing Wang um, and uh, Shiza Lu and also Hainang Xiong. And I'm sorry if I didn't get everyone's name quite right. Okay, so can we have the presentation view up? Yeah, yeah, sure. Wonderful. Take it away. So, shall we start? So hi everyone, my name is Yixin Wang and uh, I'm a third year computer science student. Hainan, where are you? <laughs> oh, yeah. Can you hear me now, right? Yeah. Okay, so I'm Hainan, I'm a junior student majoring in applied mathematics. Hello, my name is Sijia Liu and I'm a sophomore in data science major. So we are mentored by Professor Tristo. The topic of our project is anti-play, a gaming approach. In this project, we basically design a game which is related to COVID-19 happening around the world in 2020. First of all, let's see some background information for COVID-19. So at the moment of making this slide, the number of total confirmed cases is around 6 million. And the number of cases in the United States is around 2 million. Unfortunately, the number is still increasing. In this case, we would like to discuss a little bit about the health strategy. In each level of government is implementing different public health strategies to slow down and cut off the transmission of the virus. So we list some strategies we are familiar with here. For example, recommendation of wearing masks. Previously, we have to remind ourselves getting keys before hanging out but right now we can't forget face masks as we are usually asked to put on masks before entering public spaces. Uh, as for the cancellation of public events, for example, our classes are on Zoom and in-person interviews are canceled. Then we have social distancing and travel bans. For travel bans, it largely impacts people's plans about work and travel. Also for international students like me, we might not be able to go back to home easily, and it is relatively safe for us to not go to the airports. And finally, the stay-at-home policy influences our daily lives. For example, it changed the form of our 
final presentation today. So I want to briefly talk about the stay-at-home policy using some statistics to see how it affects the transmission of the virus. So we have two graphs based on the raw data from New York Times. These two graphs compare the growth of confirmed cases in California before and after the stay-at-home policy. March 19th is when the stay-at-home policy was announced. So it is the boundary for these two graphs. As we can see, the confirmed cases are growing slowly at first. Then around the beginning of March, the graphs start growing exponentially. But after March 19th, on graph two, the data appears to grow more linearly compared to graph one. Then we can see the effect of implementing stay at home policy from this comparison. So my part is finished and hi now will continue our presentation. So, um, okay, so Suji just introduced these public health strategies and the effect of using stay at home order to slow down the transmission of the COVID-19. And each of these strategies have different effectiveness and we want to evaluate their effectiveness on stopping the transmission. So we are using a gaming approach to achieve it. Uh, we are implementing a primitive 3D strategy game by Unity. We call it the anti-plague. Uh, I assume that most of you guys have already heard about the play game or play that before, that you are supposed to design a virus that can be transmitted as quick as possible. Uh, so we are having a quite opposite goal. Uh, we want to stop them. So, and we are implementing the simulation by the agent-based model. So generally speaking, there are two models uh, that are widely used to simulate the transmissions. The first one is called the equation-based model and the other one is the agent-based model. So the equation-based model is, is implemented from top to bottom. Although it can precisely capture the transmission state of the disease and the effectiveness of a certain strategy, it is generally hard to um, implement in the game because it is hard to combine two or more strategies together. And we are generally cannot represent the combined strategy in a single equation. And it is also hard to get some uh, essential parameters of the model. Uh, thus, we choose not to use this one. And for the agent-based model, the agent-based model applies a bottom-to-top structure. So in this model, we start from using data to represent each individual in the community. And then like the individuals interact with each other based on a set of preset rules. And then the different intervention strategy can change those rules accordingly. So by comparing the outcomes of the simulations, the researchers can summarize the effect of the interventions, uh, intervention strategy applied. This is just like what we saw in the emergence property last quarter. Um, that's why we choose to use this model. And we are inspired by the individual-based computational model of Berkey and his colleague. Uh, they use this to simulate the effectiveness of different public health strategy to fight against the smallpox, uh, which was eliminated decades ago. And we're gonna use this one to simulate a different strategy on fighting the coronavirus. Oh, I forgot to mention, and this is much more easier to implement compared to the equation-based model. So let's see how did we design our game. Uh, we are writing the C-sharp script in the Unity platform. To simulate, the, uh, to simulate the real world, we create some homes, workplaces, hospitals, rules, and of course people. So uh, we are using the primitive object from the Unity assets to represent them. So in this full picture in the slides, there are five objects, the rules, the house, workplace, hospital, and people. Uh, you can see this solid small balls or spots on each graph. They are the people. And you can see they have different colors. So the color represents their health conditions. The green means they are safe and healthy. And the orange means they are the carrier of the virus but has not been confirmed or identified yet. And the red means they have been confirmed and hospitalized. There is also gonna be a blue one, which is not in this graph yet, but you will see the blue ones later in the simulation. The blue means that these people have recovered from the virus. And in our settings, people will leave their houses around 7 a.m. to go to their workplaces and return home around 5 p.m. Uh, in our game, we are simulating two public health strategies, putting on masks and staying at home. So different strategies will have different impact on the probability of each individual transmitting virus to others and 
contracting the virus farther. And this will lead to the change of the productive number of the, the virus. Okay, so now it's Yixin's turn to start a simulation. Here we go, Yixin. So yeah, so let's see what the game actually looks like. Uh, cr currently the game is still under development, so uh, so yeah, I'm sorry about that, but let's just focus on this area. So as Hainan mentioned, uh, currently there are three kinds of buildings. Um, they are the houses where people live, uh, which are represented by these three uh, white bricks and the working places where people will go during daytime, which are represented by the blue bricks, blue bricks and uh, the hospital which are represented by the green bricks. And uh, in the upper left corner, we have a panel which indicates how many days have passed since the simulation starts. And uh, we, ha we have time which will display what time it is on that day. And then we have a list which will display the population, uh, the cumulative number of infected people. Uh, remember those are people who are infected but, but are not confirmed yet and the cumulative number of detected people or uh, confirmed cases, and the number of recovered people and the number of the deaths. So uh, the transition logic here is like this. So healthy people can be potentially infected, but they won't immediately know that. So we need to wait for a period of time called incubation time for the symptom to appear. And people might then choose to go to the hospital and uh, once an infected person arrives in the hospital, they will be counted as detected or confirmed. And again, after a while, they might get cured uh, or there's a small possibility that they can get killed by the disease. So let's actually run the game. So yeah, these green balls represent healthy people and the Orange balls, let's see, where are they? There are just two infected cases right now. Oh, here. So the orange balls represent infected people. And people are leaving their houses starting from 7 a.m., heading to their workplaces, and uh, they will go back home starting from 5 p.m. And people can possibly get infected as they collide with each other just like this. And uh, we will use the collisions of the balls to simulate personal context in our real life. And uh, if we wait a period of time after someone gets infected for the incubation time, that person might want to go to the hospital. Uh, let's see if we can have any, anyone here. No, so here, here we go. So once infected people get to the hospital, they will be counted as detected or confirmed. And the red balls here represent people who are confirmed to have the disease. So right now you can see that detected is one, and uh, they will just sit there in the hospital to get some treatment. And yeah, as you can see, it's 5 p.m. and the people are going back home. And let's wait for more confirmed cases, actually. So after getting some treatment, which for now takes half of the day, I believe, in the game, uh, then, so then, then they can get cured and go back to their houses. Or there's a possibility that uh, uh, they, they will die, unfortunately. OK, so there's still one detected cases. Right now, okay, two of them. So yeah, so this blue ball here represents the recovered person, and under current setting, that once they are recovered, they will never get infected again. And I know it might not be the case with COVID nineteen, but but you know we can always fix up later in the future. So, uh, so, but what can the player do? Currently, there isn't really too much that players can do since we only finished the implementations of two strategies. 
which are um, place data comforter and uh, encouraging people to wear face masks. So if I select stay at home order, then most people won't go out to work in the morning anymore. And uh, we, uh, but we still have a setting that not all of them will obey the order. So we will still see people going out, but the number of them will be hugely decreased. And if I select uh, encouraging people to wear face masks, then by doing so, I actually reduce the possibility for people to get infected uh, within every contact or, or collision in the game. So I will select both of them for now and uh, resume the game. And theoretically, we will see the infected cases increase much slower. But you know, uh, I tune some parameters like incubation time and the uh, infection possibility just to make sure that our game runs faster for demonstration purposes. So we might not see the effects of these strategies that clearly, but uh, let's, let's see. Yeah, as you can see, it's already 7 a.m., but most people are still staying at home instead of going to workplaces. And the one more thing you can do is that you can always take back these strategies to see uh, that whether or not it is a good timing to reopen the economy and you know, relax those policies which is an important issue that many states are actually considering right now. And as you can imagine that once we added more uh, strategies, players can combine and apply some of them at the same time or make changes to those strategies at different stages of the simulation. So, so yeah, we can wait for the simulation to converge to a stable stage where no more people get infected or all infected people are recovered. And we can save the data and analyze them and uh, you know, compare it to our real world data. But we haven't implemented the saving, saving data functionality. So, uh, so yeah, that's pretty much about it. And hi now we talk about our future plans. Um, I hope we still have time to wrap it up. So currently we simulate our game in a pretty naive way and we want to add more complex feature into our game in the future. So for example, we want to have a distribution of ages of people and analyze their vulnerability to the disease according to their age. Because right now we, had, we can see that apparently that the old people are more vulnerable to the COVID-19 compared to young people. And we also want to integrate the condition of shortage of medical supplies into our games. Uh, this is a case uh, one or two months ago when the United States was short of ventilators. So without ventilators, people are dying from it. And we also want to reflect both pros and cons of the different strategies. And we also want to ref and refine our construction of buildings. Uh, we want to make it more beautiful and realistic. Um, that's pretty much all about our presentations. Uh, thank you guys for listening to us and a special thanks to Professor Trey Strong. Thank you for your support. Yeah. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. What a great way to start this day. This is so timely and um, really, really quite impactful. So um, uh, this is the point at which we are happy to take questions and what we want is uh, for participants to raise their hand. So those of you who are familiar with this, um, you, you actually uh, go into the, the um, as an attendee, you can, you can raise your hand. Um, let's see, or, or you probably see it perhaps uh, in a different, your view is different than mine, but um, please, I'm, I'm looking for hands. I don't see any right now. Does anyone have any questions? We'll come now. It was such an excellent presentation. There's got to be a question. The students know that I'm really good at cold calling people, but I'm not necessarily going to do that to our attendees who are not, <laughs> not currently students. I see Irish. Uh, Irish. Uh, uh, yeah, Irish. Cool. Irish, you on mute? Wonderful. Yeah. Um, so cool. I had a quick question on on the simulation, I was wondering if you'd also be able to alter your simulation so that it tracks the, the spread of disease through like food products or through 
uh, in like through tangible goods rather than just through people. Uh, do you mean fruit products? Yeah, so like not like through like objects and whatnot. Like if someone touches like a pole, like can you track the spread of that? Not necessarily just through uh, human contact. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That's a. I think that's a great factor to consider. Yeah. <laughs> can also be added to our future plan. Cool. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. And how about um, Natasha? Is she? Let's see. From what I heard, she had a question. Do I see Natasha here? There we are. Natasha, do you have a question? Well, yes, I, I do. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, okay, good. One was, can you, um, how long does it take for simulation to converge? And the other one is, could you kind of implement what, I guess, the city of San Diego is doing is, if you do this in phases, can you simulate, for example, people can only go to work or, you know, is the opening of the beaches and parks, how much that influences the transmission rates? That's something you could incorporate as well. Yeah, so as for the second question, I, I think, uh, I think our professor Stone also mentioned that. So uh, it's better to like to include something like beach and park and uh, you know, just some places that, uh, other than the workplaces that will gather people. And I think that's a very reasonable uh, advi advice, yes. So uh, we'll consider to do that uh, in the future. And also for the first, I, I, I didn't quite follow up the first question. What is it again? How long does it take for simulation to converge? Uh, does it at I all? Think, I mean, it doesn't uh, with the, to with the current parameters, I said it just maybe less than less than ten minutes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great presentation. I, thank you, guys. Yeah, sure. Thank you. But with like with realistic uh, parameters, if if we fetch realistic parameters uh, of through nineteen, I think the game will be will be stretched. So. Yeah. Yeah, I echo that. This is fantastic, and I think it's got real, real potential. And uh, you know what? What uh, an excellent amount of work that you've done in these past two quarters, and and remotely <laughs> for the last one. So, so well done, congratulations, um, and uh, I thank you for your presentation. And I now want to, and I'm sad that this is so. We have so many to get through, but we want to move on to the next presentation. Yep. where we will have Alicia and Laura presenting work on um, uh, considerations about food, food security, food accessibility um, in a project with their advisor, um, Professor Ramesh Rao, who we heard from earlier. So this, I think, was, was really interesting and is perhaps even more timely now as food became such a, such a an, uh, challenging thing to Yet people were worried about what's accessible, what's not. But this is something that college students face all the time. Like, what are they able to cook in their rooms? What are they able to eat that is nutritious, um, but fast and accessible to them? And so this, these considerations were um, a part of the project that um, Alicia and Laura will tell us about today. So I will let you two take it away from here. Except that they, there we go. All right. Yeah, now we're seeing them. Wonderful. Okay, everyone. So, hello. Hope you're all doing great. Um, welcome to our comprehensive food app. It's a project promoting food security in college um, students. I'm Alicia Gunawan, and um, my teammate is Laura Dia. Okay, so in our project, we noticed that college students were extremely susceptible to food insecurity. Some factors which contribute to this problem were the high cost of ingredients, particularly in food markets on campus, as well as the lack of healthy food options in dining halls, among other hindrances. 
So overall, we aim to increase food literacy for students and teach them that having a healthy diet is possible with all of the limitations that they have. And there are two things that set our project apart. One thing is how we look at resources due to how our recommender system takes into account what utensils and kitchenware students have on hand. Um, the other is educating students not only about why these nutrients are important to their health, but also educating them about the sustainability of their food. Okay, so in our break it down, we've identified various things, but not all of it is necessarily implemented due to time constraints. But overall with students, we've identified factors such as what traditions they have in their household, um, dietary preferences, for instance, being vegetarian or being vegan, et cetera, um, their financial freedom, as well as their location and constraints. Um, with food companies, we found various agents such as, or things they've done, like dishonest labeling, the use of GMOs, and other additives. We found it extremely important to educate students about these dishonest practices because it's definitely important for their awareness of what's going into their body. Yeah, we also discovered um, some aspects of society that's important for us in this app. For example, um, diet trends. We want to educate people about the dangers or benefits of certain diet trends like keto, paleo, Mediterranean. They all have pros and cons, but it's important that you be fully informed in order for this diet to be safe and in order for this diet to be effective. We also want to encourage people to eat out less. I know where the, the target audience is college students. College students don't necessarily eat out a lot, but there's, I find that there's a certain belief that restaurant food is always better than food at home, which is untrue. And that's something that we also want to improve because um, segging into our next topic, food literacy, learning how to cook well is an important part of food literacy. It's sadly not a topic that's currently taught as well as it should be. People don't necessarily know how to eat healthily, which is unfortunately um, a fact of life. But through this app, it's something that we'd like to focus on. Okay, so for our research, we looked at various sources. Um, one of the first ones we looked at discusses how educating students about food literacy and climate change actually has indeed left an impact on their carbon footprint. And this is related to our project because of our intent to educate students about sustainability and food literacy. Um, another source that we looked at underlines the importance of recognizing the personal struggles that students face in affording healthy food. And so our third source focused more on the implementation because we wanted to ensure that we recommended recipes that students preferred, but also recipes that were good for students. Um, and those don't necessarily coincide, but sometimes they can as well. So one source that we found um, balanced, basically balanced um, the health of a certain recipe and balanced the preferences through an ingredient-based recipe recommender system. And that was what we drew inspiration from. Definitely. And in the next source we looked at, we discovered that the actual use of food nutrition apps decrease the perception of barriers to healthy food eating because with the implementation of these apps into the user's lifestyle, it helped them plan their meals more efficiently and kind of guided them along the way. And so usually it's kind of seen as a challenge to like, I don't know, eat a salad. But besides that, if you have something to help guide you, the process becomes a little easier to look at. And then lastly, the, we found information that supports the notion that maintaining a healthy diet long-term has an effect on controlling the morbidity of chronic diseases and stuff like that. Okay, so after we, sorry, after we performed gap analysis, um, some strengths we found while analyzing other food apps include the convenience of mobile ordering because in a food app that controls a delivery service, it's like right at your fingertips. So it's extremely easy to like order whatever you want. And then besides that, we found the visual appeal to be very impressive because of all the graphics and all the formatting. 
as long as it's visually appealing, it's definitely going to be user friendly. And then besides that, we also found the wide range of food options offered. Um, despite their wide range of food options, we found there was a lot of promotion of unhealthy food options over healthier options because as college students, we tend to go for things that appeal to our taste buds more than our health sometimes. And then besides that, the, we found the carbon footprint of food delivery services would be quite high because the use of um, fossil fuels to run vehicles in order for delivery services to run place to place would definitely increase the carbon footprint by that industry. And then lastly, we found that food delivery services do not target food insecurity because oftentimes the prices that they show for the foods they deliver are marked higher in order to for them to receive a profit from just delivering that food. So we're currently still focusing on optimizing the back end, but we've prov we've provided just um, how a user might go about accessing our web app. Here is a presentation. Okay, so here's our first web page, and over here we will enter our biometrics. For instance, I'm 20 years old, my height and weight. Okay, next we will enter our gender and then our level of exercise. Over here, we will select our available kitchenware and then available utensils we have. And then if you have any dietary restrictions, you can choose them over here. And lastly, our cuisine preferences. So you can choose whatever cuisines that you like. And after we submit all of that information, we are redirected to a new page where it has a few recipes according to our preferences before. So if we open one of them in a new tab, we are redirected to a new page with all of the recipe details and instructions. Lastly, uh, this is the page displaying our caloric intake history. So this is, for instance, how many calories you consumed on the first day of the month, on the average of the other days. And over here is another graphic showing our nutrients that we focused on. For instance, in this color, we show how much calcium we have previously consumed and how much we have left to consume from the foods we have previously eaten in the day. And with this button, you can enter a new food. And then below all of that, we have an infographic showing all of our focus nutrients and descriptions as to why we chose them and how they're important to consume regularly. So what we first did was we scraped recipes from several websites like Epicurious, Food Network, Bon Appetit. Those are well-known uh, recipe websites that are pretty popular. A lot of um, people look through these sites also. We also paired the data from those websites that we scraped with USDA data, which is more reliable, but does not have um, a description of recipes or the images, as you can see in the video. Um, but it also has nutritional information. So we paired those two together. And we also found data on cuisine and the unique ingredients associated with certain cuisines. We took into consideration the fact that, of course, like things like salt, pepper, or garlic, say, are all popular in all cuisines. But for example, certain unique ingredients like hoisin sauce for Chinese cuisines might not necessarily be something that other cuisines use. So that would be counted. So what we did was, um, as you can see from the, at the start of the um, website, that you could choose which cuisines you preferred, which is our first, which is our jump start to say. So we first of all filtered our data set by looking through all of the um, available kitchenware they have, all of the utensils that they have, um, and all that sort of thing. We filtered that data set, and after that, we requested what cuisines they preferred, and then we could give our first recommendation. And after that, we haven't exactly implemented this yet, but so users will be able to rank whether or not they like certain recipes. And from that, we will rank the ingredients within these recipes. 
which will inform the recommender system to recommend the next set of um, recipes that a user would like. And we do this by, again, doing it, um, doing a ingredient-based recommender system. So we, what we have right now, and it's obviously not necessarily the best, but what we have right now is that um, each ingredient is ranked a certain number based on whether or not um, a user prefers a recipe or not. And this number is, um, and a recipe has multiple ingredients, right? And you take the average of the rankings of each ingredient, and that's the overall ranking of that recipe. And that informs how the recommender system is going to rank each recipe that we have in this database. So it's obviously not perfect. We obviously have a lot of things to do, but overall, we found that while there were challenges, like for example, we had to learn HTML to build the web app. We had to research things about recommender systems. Should we do it um, content-based? Should, be, should we build a collaborative recommender system? We also had time constraints as well, but as we performed break it down gap analysis, as we implemented everything that we learned, it became a lot more interesting and a lot more fun to apply these techniques to the problem that we have. And since this is a huge problem, because we're trying to tackle food literacy, right? And it, that's no small thing. Um, since this is a huge problem, we can already pinpoint so many ways in which we can further this project. Like, for example, um, one of our main priorities is to integrate um, price points of each recipe, which we haven't done. We could also integrate new dietary lifestyles, like, as I said before, paleo, keto, Mediterranean. If you want to lose weight, we could also do um, methods like intermittent fasting, that sort of thing. Our ultimate goal is to implement a working app as we've done the back end, but we haven't necessarily completed the front end of this app, sadly. But again, um, you know, summer is right around the corner. Um, so this is something that me and Laura are definitely enthusiastic to keep pursuing. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Wonderful. Thank you so much. This is this is excellent, and I want it. Uh, I know I'm not in college and far from it, but um, you know what? What a wonderful way um, for for people to consider the thing that we all do. We all need to eat, right? And to have some data informed ways of of making those decisions that we do on a regular basis can help us, you know, move toward habits that are better for us than than not. Okay, so uh, we presumably have some questions. Yes, um, actually, ephemeral. Go ahead, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, okay, so first off, um, this was just an incredible presentation. Um, the visuals were great, the product was incredible. Great work on that front. Um, my question is, when it came to the web scraping, how were you able to get nuances like what tools were needed from the recipes um, easily converted into the format in which you're presenting them because I know a lot of these Bon Appetit recipes have like long backstories and histories involved and they don't necessarily directly share um, you need this very specialized whisk to make this dish. So this was a this was a major struggle actually something that we didn't necessarily anticipate but Right now, our solution is not exactly the most um, elegant, but what we did was we basically had certain keywords for each, um, for each utensil, for each like, type of kitchenware. Uh, since we don't have necessarily complicated things like, you know, use an egg whisk or use like some sort of special technical whisk, we just had whisks. So um, if there were certain words, like for example, whisking or like stirring, but then there are certain ingredients attached to this description, or like if it was associated with something like baking, for example, we knew immediately that you would absolutely have to use a whisk for this, and that if you didn't use a whisk, for example, to whip up egg whites, then you obviously fail this recipe, right? This definitely took, um, took up um, the majority of our time trying to figure out. Filtering everything was, yeah. Wonderful, thanks. I think Ephemeral wants one too. And here is Gina. Go ahead, Gina. Um, as of now, how many recipes do you have in the app? Um, we scraped from many Three sources. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not sure how much exactly we have, but it's in the thousands. 
tens of thousands at least i'm pretty sure yeah yeah but yeah like so our our back end is actually this is something that we're planning on improving obviously our back end is kind of our functions run quite slow since we have yeah. a pretty big database this is great. I guess I should have mentioned, I don't know if you said it, but you're both um, data science students, yes? Yeah. 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 Um, fantastic, right? I mean, what a what a great way to showcase how you can use those tools along with the tools that you learned in class in order to build something really useful that we can all, we can all put together. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. And as we um, move forward uh, to the next presentation, unless there are further questions, which I Moment. Questions? Can I ask a question? Leah, this is Johnny. Um, yeah. um, I love your app. Um, I am a big foodie. I like to cook a lot as well. Have you guys ever thought of um, a section where you can incorporate the ingredients you already have at your home? Like if I already have hoisin, I could just check that off and then maybe mm. it could prefer certain ones because like Johnny has hoisin, a rice cooker, and a whisk. So he can make this. So yeah, just just uh, another thing you could add during the summer if you have time. We have so many ideas, but mm -hmm. yeah, like time constraint, that's the major part of any project that we have to deal with. Yeah, great project. Thank you. Wonderful, and, and yes, great project. And so now as all these other students are seeing it, that you, you've all had a call, an email from me that if you want to continue in research, I want to pair mm -hmm. you up with um, some, some projects and you know, all of, the, all of the ones, the two that have presented so far and, and most of them that we'll be hearing, you know, still have some work to do. And so this is, a, this is not something that um, could, could go further. Thank you. Okay, next up, we have a group that was focusing on contraceptive use in India and trying to understand really what groups are uh, involved, what groups are, are doing, um, um, how they're behaving uh, based on some uh, different different uh, policies that might be local or beliefs and so it's a big 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 project and it involves a lot of um, people in particular the mentor is Dr. Natasha Balak and it also involves um, some some uh, public health research researchers uh, Anita Raj in particular Dr. Anita Raj and so I'm hoping that they will tell you more about the incredible amounts of data collection that were involved in and their window into that over these last two quarters. So I invite Ayush and Gina and Melina to please take it away. Thank you. Okay, um, so yeah, uh, my name is Ayush and I'm a second year data science major. Um, I'm Melina. I'm a first year nanoengineering major. My name is Gina and I'm a first year bioinformatics major. So for the past two quarters, we have been working with Dr. Balak and Arnav on developing a reliable predictor for contraceptive usage in India. And there are multiple types of contraceptions. Um, well, yeah, there's modern methods such as sterilization and IUDs. There's traditional methods. And there's also a different kind of categorization, which is short acting methods such as condoms, long acting methods such as implants and IUDs, and irreversible methods such as sterilization. And as you can see from this diagram, the long-term methods and irreversible methods are usually more effective than the short-term methods. And India has this very unique pattern of contraceptive use in that about half of the population is not using any methods of contraception and the highest method of contraception used is female sterilization. It's 36%. If you compare it with other countries that are nearby India, it's still pretty noticeable. It's pretty distinct in that the light blue bar that you can see stands for female sterilization and India has this large light blue bar. And we performed break it down to identify four main reasons for this that affects sterilization. Oh, 
that affects contraception usage for females. First is individual reason, reasons such as religion. Second is social norms, the expectations on women to have children. Third is the health system. And fourth is reproductive coercion by other family members such as the husband or mother-in-law. Cool. So luckily for us, we didn't have to go out and have to collect this data for, uh, for our project, but it was provided to us through the DHS program, which stands for Demographic and Health Surveys. And this organization just spreads out these questionnaires to various countries and collects information on the citizens. And so not necessarily just focusing on sexual health and habits, but also could focus on different issues such as domestic violence, nutrition, and family composition. And so an important thing that we needed to do was to figure out what data that we what data we needed for our project that was relevant. And so we broke it down into three different categories: uh, background characteristics on the wife and husband of the couples that we're looking at, such so as their age and education level, as well as questions regarding reproductive health and the types of contraception that they used and the information that they knew about contraception. Um, so yeah, as Professor Leanne stated, we had a lot of data to work with. Um, these surveys uh, collected over 60,000 individual couples. And of these questionnaires, they weren't just focused simply on uh, contraceptive health or reproductive health, but it encompassed a lot of these features that I mentioned before. And so when we narrowed it down to just reproductive health, we had over 2,860 2, features that we needed to sift through and understand uh, which ones were relevant. In addition to that, we needed to categorize our target variable or what, we're, or what we're trying to predict from these couples. And that was the type of contraception that was being used. Um, there were over 17 recorded forms of contraception in these questionnaires, which made it difficult to predict them through our models. So we decided to break them down into two different categories, category one and category two. Category one had two different levels, uh, placing the types of contraception in either no contraception used or traditional methods and any modern methods. Well, cat category two focused on no methods or traditional methods, short-term methods, long-acting reversible contraceptives and permanent methods such as sterilization. Um, we then also had to look at all the features that existed because we had a lot of missing data. We had to make some decisions based off of that, whether we should impute values or should we neglect them. Um, we decided to uh, get rid of those features that had high null values, as well as incorporating one-hot encoding which transformed our categorical variables into quantitative variables that allowed us to use our modeling. And then additionally, with all these, uh, uh, with the models that we created, we were able to recognize features that revealed the answer, revealed the, the thing that we were trying to predict. So within those answers that we were trying to uh, ask, they would say that the, the couple was sterilized or used a specific form of contraception. So through that trial and error process, we were able to eliminate a lot of features. Okay, so, the, so we all took three different approaches um, on approaching, we, so we all had three different approaches in terms of creating our models. I created the model using Python and focusing on the pandas library to clean our data as well as using uh, uh, sklearn, using, creating a random forest classifier. The reason I decided to use a random forest classifier to, to find these predictors is because it allows us to, it gives us a good predictive performance when using this model as well as providing low overfitting. So it's not tailored exactly to the data and it could work well with additional data that we collect. Also, a really nice thing about random forest classifiers is that it allows us to interpret the importance of a feature. And this is important because we, are, we asked a lot of questions, but we want to figure out what key characteristics of these couples entice them to use a certain type of contraceptive. And so the way that random forests work is that they collect many decision trees. And so for instance, I listed a decision tree that we used for uh, one of the one of 500 decision trees. And from this, we were able to evaluate which features are important. Okay, so I created two random forest classifiers to target both categories. One was focused on the category one, so two levels, either using no or traditional methods or any modern methods. Um, here we have a horizontal bar chart listing the importance of the features. So if we go to the next slide here, um, it's essentially the same thing that you saw previously, but it 
it orders out the, the feature names. One thing that is really interesting from, from cleaning up the data is that initially when we're creating these random forest classifiers, we noticed that a lot of the, a lot of the general family char uh, characteristics of couples seem to be a large factor, such as the age, the number of children they had. And, be, and although that these are like, this is interesting and does affect our data, it doesn't really tell us much about the behavior of the Indian couples just because we already know that if a couple is newly married and is young, they're more likely to uh, conceive children. So by cleaning through, by doing the trial and error random forest classifiers, we were able to select some features. And so uh, something that was really interesting that stood out from our results is that a lot of a, a decision for a woman's choice of contraceptive was mostly influenced or, or somewhat influenced by a husband's uh, choices. So the things that I boxed over here are a lot of uh, are questions that were asked to the husband and their responses to that. And so a large factor in a woman's contraceptive usage is the husband's decision, which could be reflective of the patriarchal order that exists in India. Um, the next slide, and the ne so this slide here is the same idea, but now instead of looking at category one, which categorized two levels, we're looking at category two, which had four different levels of contraceptive. Um, here's the order of importance, and in the next slide, it highlights the same thing. So they're not necessarily going to be in the same order as the previous random force classifier, but they both share very similar characteristics in that the husband's opinion or the husband's uh, choices largely influence the woman's choice in contraception. Sorry. Okay, so for my part of the project, I saw that there's a big relationship between family size and contraceptive usage. So instead of using Python, I used a data analysis software called NIME to create um, decision tree models that showed these relationships. So this table depicts several variables that were commonly used as root splits for decision trees, illustrating that they were very important in creating models for contraceptive use. So I outlined the variables related to family size in this table. They're outlined in red. Um, so basically what you can see is a lot of them have to do with um, family size. So there's sons at home, daughters at home, number of children, uh, ideal number of boys, ideal number of children. But as you can see, the ideal number of female children isn't particularly significant because it's kind of affected by missing values. Um, can you go to the next slide? On the decision tree over here, um, there is a clear difference in contraceptive usage depending on the number of ch living children. The model indicates that after having around two children, more couples begin to choose sterilization in order to stop having children. This is further supported by the data in, the, in that the average ideal family size is between two and three children. The decision tree also splits up even further with the variable sons at home, showing that this that once a couple, couple has more than one son, they're more likely to utilize permanent methods of, of contraception. This illustrates an interesting phenomenon in India. Um, the ideal family is made up of more sons than daughters, but various articles indicate that daughters are still desired, even though that um, less are preferred. This can be attributed to the cultural expectation for sons um, to care for their parents financially when they get older. However, in my research, I found that female education is the most significant factor in lowering preference for sons. Can you go to the next slide? Yeah, so that's kind of what I talked about here. Um, after learning this, I wanted to create a variable called has ideal number of sons just to see how this would affect the data. Can you go to the next slide? So you can, it's kind of hard to see, but um, from this decision tree, it's evident that if a couple has equal or less than their ideal number of sons, um, they're more likely to not use any method of, of contraceptives. And another significant discovery here is that age also has a really important role in um, contraceptive usage because after age 35, women are more likely to get sterilized in this model. So this kind of reflects the cultural trend of starting families at younger ages in India. For my sample, I 
just decided to ex exclude individuals who wanted another children because it made sense that if you want another children, then you won't take any methods of contraception. So I was building decision trees and coming up with models. Then I noticed that variables related to healthcare professionals were recurring in the decision trees. So I gathered all the variables related to information access and media so, and healthcare, and I started making decision trees out of those. As you can see in this diagram on the right, the told by healthcare worker about methods of family planning is the splitting note, which means that it is important within the decision tree. This, in this decision tree also, told by his health worker is the splitting node. And I did a random forest analysis, which supported this finding because told by healthcare worker was the node, the root node for most of the trees. And I started doing some research. I talked to Arnab about what I discovered. And it turns out in India, healthcare workers are incentivized, monetarily incentivized for promoting sterilization. And they have these sterilization camps that are now banned, but at the time that the data set was made was not, that can sterilize very quickly, but also is very unsanitary. And this was kind of, a surprising interesting moment where our data and analysis supported an observed social phenomena and its possible impact. But this finding could also be because healthcare workers are more active in rural areas. So residential area as a variable could actually be the better predictor. So there's this tricky question of causation versus correlation between talking to a healthcare worker and a female's choice in contraception. I definitely want to look deeper and find evidence to support either causation or correlation and come up with possible points of intervention involving healthcare workers and policy changes because they seem to play an important role in females' contraception choice. There was also this pretty interesting finding about television and how it's related to contraception, contraception usage, but due to time limitations, I will skip that part. So the goal of our research is to use what we found in our predictive models to understand what individuals are more likely to utilize or why certain individuals are more likely to utilize certain contraceptives over others. Sterilization as Gina mentioned, is extremely common in India. And by making these models, we hope to limit the use of this permanent procedure in place of non-permanent contraceptives. A secondary goal of ours is to identify those who may desire birth control and pro provide better ways of providing it to them through the media. Or, I mean, yeah, providing them to them and advertising it in the media, but yeah. Also, a big thank you to Dr. Valak and Arna for helping us so much and supporting us with relevant knowledge. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Wow, and so um, and before we take questions, I actually just wanted to, because this was a great example of students working together with Arna, who is a graduate student, is that correct? Yeah, graduate student, um, data collected in a public health realm, working with Natasha Bullock. I'd like to point out, which was said very quickly early on, Ayush is an upperclassman who's actually taking a leadership role in data science, as I understand it, in the next year. And Melina and Gina are both first years. So anybody who says that we can't effectively engage undergraduate students to do meaningful research on this campus needs to come and watch this because this is awesome. And what you're doing is so wonderful and impactful and hopefully um, useful to you as you move forward and learn how to apply what you're learning in your classes to real world situations. Okay, I stopped talking and I asked for questions. Questions? 
some questions. Anyone, anyone? There's a lot of data here. Maybe Arnav has something to say. Celia? Um, I'm not seeing any questions. Oh, Natasha, thank you. Okay, go ahead, Natasha. <laughs> Dr. Bullock. All right. I don't know if I'm allowed to ask questions since you know I was the the mentor, but um, I do wish Arnav could speak up and, and talk about it. And Arnav was invaluable help. It was just awesome to have him. But I guess what I wanted students, it was really interesting because when this team, each one of the students had a different hypothesis or set of hypotheses that they worked on. And I guess I just wanted to maybe have each one of them um, answer the question, what was the biggest takeaway that they learned? Because they really had to learn data science. Um, I guess I used knew some of it, but um, we, you know, we we actually had literally lectures on data science, how you prep and, and run models and use new tools, learn new tools, um, as well as learn about this specific topic. So when you put all of that together, I kind of wanted to see what did what did you guys feel like was the biggest takeaway from um, from this AIP project. Um, I guess I can start, but. I really came into this not knowing any data science. Um, and I think like wanting to come to each of our meetings with something to show, like really made me work really hard on this outside of it. Um, so I think like honestly, just having um, a project like this to like motivate me and prove to me that I can do something like this without like a lot of experience uh, meant a lot. But yeah. I guess for me, it was really powerful to see how data, which is something very like, numerical and it feels very scientific, and how that could kind of translate into real societal problems that people are dealing, dealing with in their everyday lives, and finding kind of the literature and reports that support it was really interesting. And it showed me how things that I do can be closely related to something tangible. Um, for me, I think a really big takeaway is the fact that we were actually able to do a complete data science project. Usually a lot of people just tend to focus on like the cool machine learning aspects of it. But the fact that we were able to get our own data and most of my time was actually spent cleaning this data because there was just so much to go through. And so being able to clean up the data and then also going through all the different like machine learning processes and then also having to present our project and findings to you made it really helpful. And so I was able to practice all those types of skills and also learn a lot about machine learning because there would be times where like I was so invested in this project that I just kind of would neglect my classes. So thank God for that pass, no pass deadline. But I mean, it was a really interesting project just to apply like skills that I kept picking up like in my classes that I'm taking right now or like what I've known before. And just like learning different things and applying them in this project. Awesome. Thank you. It was a pleasure working with you guys. Super fun. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you all. And, and again, great work. And, you know, kudos to you for continuing and driving this forward, you know, remotely and, <laughs> and showing what was possible. This is very impressive. Fantastic. And now we have uh, Anna who has been working with um, professors Fauna Foreman and Teddy Cruz, and in particular, um, someone named Kyle, uh, who's, who's a, a research staff member, who has been supporting her in a really interesting project that has been um, uh, in the works for a long time. And Anna was supposed to have other people on the team with her, but unfortunately their schedules made it such that they needed to drop the class. And so Anna has been working with the team of students who are, are also on this project, which is, um, at the border, supporting uh, young people in Davina, children, um, and learning some skills, technical skills, and um, with the, the eye to the future of taking e-waste here at UC San Diego and putting it to use in an entrepreneurial capacity in the community. So it was a big, big, big project, and I'm looking forward to Anna telling you about her piece of it and, and what she's taking away. So thank you, Anna. Take it away. 
Um, so first, let me share my screen. Okay. So my project is essentially we're introducing a digital literacy program in the Divina, the Divina Community Station. Um, I was mentored by Danella Perez for some time and then passed on to Carl Haynes, both people who helped me a lot, so special thanks to them. Uh, first, some background on what we're working on. The Divina Community Station, it's located in Tijuana in Mexico and it holds after school programs for kids. The Divina community is an underserved community. They don't have a lot of access to technology, unfortunately. Um, so the community station basically aims to have kids have somewhere to go after school and just learn more than they do in school and class. So the problem with technology in Divina could be fixed by the e-waste problem at UCSD. Um, we receive a lot of fundings for technology and stuff like that, and the old technology that people don't really work with anymore usually gets thrown away or recycled when it could just easily be reused and repurposed. So the idea of this project is that we take the e-waste at the school and we just fix it up, repurpose it for the kids at Divina. Right now, they only have five computers in the classrooms and the class sizes are usually 20 kids. So it's really hard to have them all experience being in the computer, especially since most of them don't have any at home. So this program uh, aims to add some more technology into their lives since we're all connected, especially in a situation like this. So. We had this approach to the problem. It has an economic issue in Divina that people don't have economic access, like economic methods to have access to technology. And they also don't have the knowledge of technology because they don't have access to it. So for this part of the project right now, we're focusing from a pedagogical standpoint, meaning that we are teaching kids at Divina digital literacy, computer science and engineering, and robotics, and also always focusing on ecopreneurship, always with an ecological standpoint of everything that we do there, always being aware of the effects that we have on the planet and teaching that to the kids. And we also hope that this program will continue on at Divina with the community educators there. So our goal is also to teach, like tutor the community educators through our own program so they can move on with the program by themselves. So the execution of the program that we did over these past couple quarters, the original plan was to have clubs at UCSD and organizations, we were already in contact with some of them, have them come in and help out with restoring the computers, and everything that we needed for the kids. Unfortunately, that didn't happen right now. Uh, we were also gonna develop the digital literacy curriculum and apply it at the same time with the adjustments that we saw fit, like with how kids responded. And then at the end, we would hold a science fair where the kids could present everything that they learned and develop a fun project for them. But unfortunately, that also didn't happen because of Corona. So here are the adaptations that we had planned. Um, the restoring the computers has been postponed until campus activity returns to normal. Uh, we, I mean, the good part of this is that we had more time to develop the curriculum. We could really get into specifics and make sure that it can be continued on throughout the years and even applied at other UCSD community stations. And we also saw that the Divina community had little access to accurate corona information. So through the Facebook page of the community station, we brought accurate information for them, things that were not being passed along in the community. So we also actively focused on helping out with spreading that information for them. And this is the curriculum that we've been working on. You can see that we go from the very basics of computers because most of these kids don't know the basics, the very basics, turning on a computer, stuff like that. So we're starting from the very beginning. We also want them to be fully aware of everything that is online. 
how they should behave online because I think internet's a very powerful tool and I think kids should be aware of it. Um, we also introduced them to engineering, my personal favorite lesson plan because it has some really fun projects that I think the kids would love. Um, my partner that worked with me on this, Nagin, she got a grant that we're able to get some robots for the kids to build and play with, which I think is gonna be really fun for them. And then towards the end, we focus on research and ecopreneurship for the science fair so kids can develop program, can develop their projects with our help. And then this is an example lesson plan right here. You can see that we have um, standards of education. So this program can be easily adapted in other places. We have clear objectives in every lesson plan of everything that we want to teach the kids that day. And then we have a step-by-step -step of everything that we're going to walk the kids through and talk to them. And then an activity group, activity stations. We saw that this was the easiest way to have kids access everything that we had planned for them. It was a challenge because um, the attendance varies a lot because it's not a mandatory program. A lot of kids are just there to spend some time after school and they also vary a lot in ages. So we wanted to be aware of the difficulties that we would have. So these stations allow that for the younger kids, we have coloring stations in case they have any problems with the material that we're teaching them. But then the older kids also have challenging enough material to keep them interested. We also have a materials list to make it easier for the center to buy said materials before coming into class so the kids also have access to them. And this is mostly what we've been working on this quarter, making lesson plans, making sure everything's okay and adaptable. So these are future plans. For this summer, Nagin, Nadia, and I, my two partners, we're gonna be working on an academic proposal about everything that we've done so far. Uh, it's still in the works, we're still discussing exactly what we're writing about, but it's essentially about the educational curriculum and how important it is to teach digital literacy in schools to young children. And then right now, Davina has an ecological program that um, we're planning on merging them so they can be taught concurrently and, and across all Divina community stations because these are two very important aspects of the community stations. So yeah, we also wanna make sure that the program is very easily adaptable and that other instructions can implement them without our help. We're also translating the programs because it is in Mexico, so everything needs to be in Spanish for the kids and the instructors. So during the fall, we are finally gonna contact student organizations, hopefully if everything goes back to normal. Um, we're gonna start restoring the old computers. Like I said, right now Davina only has five computers for an average of 20 kids. So we really need to work on that. We are gonna apply the curriculum at Davina, which I'm really excited about. And then we're gonna hold the science fair at the end of the quarter, which should be very exciting for me and the kids. And then this is the big picture, the program in general. The idea is that we will take these after school, after school STEM classes, teach it to the kids, and that would eventually turn into an adult program. So adult at Davina could also learn a lot more about computers. And then we would create an electronic shop with the e-waste from school and sell it at a very cheap price at Davina, which the adults would work in and it would also create demand through the classes that we're taking and the kids could also have more access to it. So essentially just bringing a lot more technology to the Davina community because it is something that they need right now, especially since we're in this long distance Corona situation. And that has been my project that I've been working on for the past two quarters. And I just want to say a very big thank you to everyone at UCSD Center of Global Justice that made all of this possible, and especially Nagin and Nadia that worked alongside me through these quarters, and they have been fantastic. So yeah, and thank you to all of you for listening to this. Wonderful. Thank you, Anna. And, and once again, you know, what a great example of you know, engaging one of our undergraduate AIP students in a project that has, you know, funding 
from from you know national sources, right? Uh, um, and also with I presume that Nadia and Nagin are graduate students, or um, they are they are fifth years. Fifth years, okay, cool. Fifth years, and, right, and and Kyle, Kyle is staff, right? So 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 really trying to incorporate like all the people in the ecosystem at the university that makes research go um, to to not only plug you into something important that is uh, relevant to to your own uh, passions, but uh, you know allowing you to apply some of what you've learned not just in class here, but in your other uh, your other learning. So what what is your what is your major? Can you mind computer me? engineering. Computer so engineering. Just teaching that to kids. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Wonderful. So do we have any questions from the group? So much here that is happening. Only a little bit of which that you got to got to tell us about and uh, implement in this past quarter. Hopefully this wasn't your first introduction to the idea that UCSD has community stations, because they do. And they're cool. Okay. Um, well, I have a question for you. Then. Um, I just wanted to know, like, what is your vision of, like, what you know? Imagine that you're at the science fair with a kid. You know, what what would be an optimal outcome there for you in terms of like what the kid takes away? I mean, the idea is that the kids learn to innovate for themselves. So I want to see something different come from the kids, you know, not the basic science fair things that we're already going to do with them that we're planning on. But I want to see something new and I just want to get them excited about STEM like people got me excited about STEM when I was a kid. So that's my major takeaway, I guess. Wonderful. Thank you. And it looks like Ramesh has a question. Yes, a wonderful presentation, Anna. Uh, I'm reminded of uh... Uh, efforts we have made in the past. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, and one of the questions that comes up is maintaining this equipment. And uh, we've gone down a path where we attempt to have student groups uh, uh, take responsibility for that. Uh, but there have also been instances in which the community itself wants to learn uh, by maintaining this equipment, right? That it's uh, uh, an opportunity for training of a different sort. And sometimes you can learn a lot more by debugging weird things that happen when your computer is not working and so on. Uh, what's your sense of the willingness of the communities that you're working with to get involved in learning on how to manage these things and use the process to learn some skills and understanding of how they work? Um, one of my partners, Nadia, she has been in the community several times over the past two years. She said that the kids are very willing to learn. They're very excited. So are the adults, all the community educators, all the parents. They seem to be very interested in what the community center has to teach. I haven't been there myself, but Nadia has been there frequently. And she says that like there's a lot of support from the community on that front. So. Yeah, thank you, because maintenance will be important. Um, I'd like to direct your attention. Um, I, I know that everyone can't see, but the panelists can. So Karen, um, uh, has, uh, who's a QI staff in, in a capacity where she's actually engaging in a lot of this like ordering of things and seeing different equipment come and go, says that you might find some way to let the equipment managers from different departments have a way to contact the program. We always know when we get good tech is on the way to get, we always know when good tech is on the way to get surplus. <laughs> Yeah, maybe instead of surplus, it goes, it goes to this project, yeah. Um, I think David Gomez is the sales director at Surplus that might be interested. None of us want to see it go into the waste stream. That's fantastic. I'll definitely make a note of that. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Karen. And thank you, Anna. Um, wonderful job. Okay, and, and here we are queuing up our next group. Um, this group, I'm excited to say that they have probably had the greatest challenge in shifting gears to uh, going remote because this group um, is mentored by um, Dr. Vincent Leon, who is the head of our circuits lab at the Qualcomm Institute. And he had proposed to do something wonderful, which was to create a tool to measure um, a, an aspect of physiological health called bioimpedance in a particular way, but it took a tool, like a thing that you have to have, generally in a lab. I will let you tell let the, the students tell them how, how they, they overcame this and um, and we can talk about it from there. So thank you students, please take it from here. 
Oh, hi everyone. Uh, this is our group. Our group topic is uh, bio impedance and uh, health. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, our group is using bioelectrical impedance analysis to measure consumer health uh, with clinical precision. Our group members include Albert Everston, Albert Miao, Bo Zhang, Carlos Wirwen, and Chi Yue Wan. Um, our mentor is uh, Vincent Leon. Hope you guys enjoy our presentation. So lately, uh, public attention uh, has shifted towards detailed monitoring of uh, personal health conditions. As we now live in a world with various kinds of digital products, many existing digital products provide such services. For example, Apple Watch can uh, monitor heart rate through an optical heart sensor using what is known as the uh, photophotography, Xiaomi Band, a digital wristband designed especially for health monitoring can accurately track light and deep sleep as well as heart rate during sleep to help you adjust your sleep pattern. Even though such products have existed on the market for years and are uh, relatively mature, most of them still rely on the monitoring of the heart rate, rendering their functionality limited. Here, we want to introduce a new method in the field of health monitoring, which is uh, bioelectrical impedance spectrophy, uh, which is largely used for assessing body compositions. Okay, so what is bioimpedance? So basically, bioimpedance is short for the term bioelectrical impedance. Thanks to Vincent, our mentor, we have obtained this device that can measure this data. And uh, as you can see in the picture here, our device is the one on the right, the smaller one. The bigger one is Raspberry Pi, which in this case, we only use as a power source. And uh, this device can send the multiple frequencies through the body in order to get the bioelectrical impedance. And uh, once we get bioelectrical impedance, we can use it to calculate several different uh, health-related um, metrics. And uh, two of the important ones are uh, fat-free mass and the uh, total body water. So fat-free mass is literally just means uh, the amount of lean mass on the body, that's no fat. Generally, the greater the proportion of uh, fat-free mass to the fat mass, the better. And the uh, Total body water, it's also easy to understand. It's basically the amount of water in your body. And generally, the greater the proportion of body water to your weight, the better. Wait, who's next? Yeah, I guess it's Albert. Albert, are there? Right. Yeah, where's Albert Mill? Over For some reason, we can't hear Albert M. Oh, speak? his computer just crashed. Okay, so um, great. So is uh, some someone else kind of fill in um, or do an interpretive dance, perhaps, about bioimpedance while we while we wait. <laughs> I know you're up for it already. <laughs> so, so we can we can wait for uh, um, Albert Mia to uh, return to us. Bummer. He gets the prize for the computer crashing at the worst time. So, did did each of you get one of these devices from Dr. Leo? Yes. yes. Awesome, way to go. Because it takes a long time to ship, and I think that's one of the reasons we uh, didn't achieve as much as we can imagine, but it's still good. Impressive. Yeah, it takes weeks for the Indonesian custom to clear the item. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so for all the observers out there, this group is not all in the States any longer. Do you want to tell us where you are? Uh, I'm in Indonesia. Yeah, me as well. Oh yeah, I'm in China now. Uh, I'm still in US. I'm in uh, Stockton, California. 
and Albert M is also in, in the U.S. Um, and hopefully getting getting back to us here right now. <laughs> yeah, he, he just texts us that uh, his computer just crashed. <laughs> okay, so so uh, is there a path that we can proceed without him for the moment? Is there a script that one of us? Can if you guys are done with it, I think we can talk about app development first. Okay. So oh, I yeah. can also ask. Um, Albert, if he wants to join by phone as well, that's another option. But I'll let you guys continue now. Wait, but, sh but he share our slides. Maybe I should open it instead. Yeah, that works. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, if he, so, so if he was controlling the slides, maybe that's if he could control them. And we can ask uh, Albert to use his new uh, his new circuit skills to diagnose his computer troubles. <laughs> ah, here he comes. Yay. Is he back? I am back. I am so terribly sorry about that. My computer literally just crashed right as I was about to present. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Uh, okay, let me really quickly get this back up and running. Oh, and I was the one presenting too, so, <laughs> okay. Let's see, let's get that back. Uh, how's this, can you guys see? Yeah. All right, fantastic. Okay, so uh, to get back on track, uh, I do hope that that crashing really gives a great indicator of sort of the technical difficulties that we've been facing this past quarter. Um, in any case, to get back on track, uh, the question then becomes, after we've measured bioelectrical impedance using the device, the question then becomes, how can we convert these values into recognizable statistics about our bodily health? Now, in order to do this, uh, I want to give a little bit of background about exactly what impedance is. Uh, impedance uh, is the electrical concept of the magnitude of the resistance and reactance of the body. So in terms of in mathematical terms, if you consider resistance and reactance to be a 2D vector projected in space, uh, you can consider impedance to be the distance from the origin to the point mapped in space. Uh, suffice it to say that varying the frequency of the current that you send through the body will affect the reactance and resistance values. And by shifting this frequency over a large enough spectrum uh, from, say, 5 kilohertz to 500 kilohertz, uh, you will obtain a plot that looks a little something like this. Um, while these ohm values seem a little bit arbitrary to uh, most folks who first glance at it, uh, needless to say, these have a very specific relationship with uh, how much uh, fluid there is in our cells, as that fluid is what determines the total resistance of the body. Now, unfortunately, we do have several limitations, mostly as a result of our device arriving uh, seven weeks after we started the project, which is very unfortunate. Um, specifically, the device only currently reads the magnitude of impedance rather than the phase angle. Uh, what this means is that we can't determine the exact proportion of reactance to resistance, which means that our uh, proportions uh, between uh, fat-free mass and fat mass may not be exactly accurate. Uh, in order to uh, fix this up, we decided to resort to estimation of the proportion of reactance and resistance uh, using several other studies that we've taken a look at that have been done over the past few decades and obtaining their results over uh, general population. So from the app's point of view, we will be receiving several inputs from the user. Uh, these inputs include uh, basic physical statistics, such as height, age, sex, and weight, as well as the impedance that was detected by the device. Uh, using these values, we can then estimate the phase angle from impedance by comparing these basic physical statistics with a chart, uh, basically a culmination of all the data that we've taken a look at uh, from the several studies that we've taken a glance at. Uh, the accumulation of this data looks a little something like this. You can see that based on each demographic of age and sex, there is a specific average resistance and reactance value. Uh, by comparing our input value and our input height, weight, age, and sex with these demographics, we can determine an estimation of the proportion between resistance and reactance. 
Now that was a lot of gobbledygook, but essentially what it comes down to are these estimation equations. Uh, specifically for fat-free mass, although these specific constants aren't exactly relevant to the detail of it, uh, you can see that the fat-free mass to fat mass is mostly based off of the ratio between resistance and reactants. In addition to this, we will also be determining total body water, uh, which is specifically based off of only the magnitude of the impedance itself. Um, so I will be explaining more on the um, app development side of our uh, research project. So uh, since we want the target user audience to be uh, as wide as possible, we need the app to run on both iOS and Android. So we have decided to use the uh, React Native mobile app development framework, which will be uh, very convenient as we won't have to do the development separately for uh, Android and iOS. But however, um, there's a catch. Uh, we want to use uh, BLE Manager as the device connects to our phones uh, through Bluetooth low energy. So uh, we need to eject Expo, which is a development tool for the uh, app development. Uh, here's the uh, icon and splash screen uh, of the app. Um, moving on, uh, we manually install and link the BLE native dependency called uh, React Native BLE Manager to the iOS side and Android side. Uh, here's a screenshot of the, our actual app um, requesting to pair through Bluetooth. And on the right side, uh, here's a screenshot of the settings app uh, on our phones. So um, then we also enabled BLE to run in the background in the Xcode settings. Then we linked it in our app.js and use functions such as this can connect to proceed with connection of the device. And um, what we're seeing here is the um, write function. So basically before we can measure any data, we have to write the comments and the arguments into the device. And then after that, we read the, um, we read from the device, which have our read function. So basically what we're reading is a bunch of um, hexadecimal values, which then we converted to uh, using regex, as you can see here, um, into integers, which then we will, uh, which then will be used in our equation to calculate uh, the, our body composition. Uh, next slides, please. Yeah, so um, this function single measurement is a combination of those two, which um, we write and read at the same time, and we get a result directly. And we can also set the frequency of, um, of the measurement which being taken place. Um, so for different for different um, purposes, we use different different frequencies. Uh, for example, for example, like for the uh, total body water, we use uh, 100 kilohertz to measure the body composition. As for the uh, fast free mass, we use 50 kilohertz. And we also have the um, some functions for testing purposes such as turn on the lights in the uh, device. And next, sli next slides, please. Yeah, so this is the um, example of our running app. So as you can see here, the, uh, the user interface is not, uh, really uh, user friendly due to the time constraint that we had. So um, when we, an another problem, uh, another uh, obstacle that we have to face is um, we have a bit of problem when um, calculating the uh, final uh, product, which will be shown here, yes. So basically the, the rad values is the um, measurement that the device 
uh, give us the impedance. And um, the result here up, uh, is using a uh, estimation and sample values that we gathered to produce this. So it's not totally accurate yet, but uh, that's what we got for now. Oh, so in conclusion, um, I would say our device is easy to set up and uh, cheap in cost to extract information of buffery mass and the total body water, which both of which are a strong indicator of uh, modern health as obesity is a big problem that uh, many societies are now facing. Um, so for future works, uh, I guess, uh, first of all, we will definitely refine the GUI of the app and uh, explore advanced information uh, to see if what other information can be extracted from the uh, bioimpedance, bioimpedance analysis. Um, lastly, there are also some uh, advanced machine learning methods that can be applied with the bioimpedance data. For example, um, based on the um, paper of Stinsky uh, in 2020, sleep apnea can be detected by combining body impedance with deep learning algorithms. Uh, then the functionality of our product can extend way beyond just the uh, total body water and uh, fat-free mass, just beyond these two factors. Um, uh, that's it for our presentation. Uh, great thanks for uh, uh, Professor uh, that's our mental. And uh, do you guys have any questions? Wonderful. Thank you very much. Let's uh, get the present. Oh, we do have a question. Let me get to the attendees. Can we oh, somebody's moved on me? Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Ephemeral, one of our one of our TAs. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. First off, great job with the time constraints to pull this all together. I had one technical question for uh, the section where Albert M was presenting the equation behind the um, uh, body impedance measurement you were doing, it looked like you were measuring sex by 4.22 something. How do you multiply a discrete variable like sex, which is usually coded zero or one into this equation? Uh, so specifically, it is one if the sex of the person is male and zero if the sex of the person is female. Yeah. These equations were obtained from, uh, from my understanding of the study by performing a systems of best fit regressions on the large amount of data that they had. Uh, had we the opportunity to perform large scale testing on a large number of participants and not freak out because there's a pandemic going on, we would likely perform the same sort of tests to develop our own custom equation. Excellent, uh, thank you. So, um, and I follow on from that, like, so there are so many other ways that at least, uh, you know, consumer uh, wearables tries to convince us that they can tell us about our health and well-being. So what might you measure as sort of like ground truth? This is kind of a new way to, to measure some, some aspect of health. You mentioned sleep apnea, but what else might you gather if you were about to go on that large data collection um, experience? Um, well, for our initial data collection, it would purely be for understanding what the general population statistics would look like. Uh, but later on, since bioimpedance analysis can tell us a lot about the body composition, it can then tell us a lot about how people are staying healthy, uh, which is a very vague way to demonstrate how diseases could potentially exist in society without us being able to detect them. Most uh, consumer-based uh, devices nowadays will base all their readings off of heart rate or sleep readings or other such uh, location-based services. And while those will give a relatively okay understanding of those diseases that affect heart rate, those diseases that will affect other aspects of sleep, they don't really give a great analysis of actual body composition. That is to say how hydrated the body is, uh, whether or not it's experiencing any lack of uh, nutrients. Uh, BMI is the closest thing that most uh, devices will use to measure this, but as anyone who is just like a little bit taller than the national average will know, BMI is not a great indicator of health. No, that's great. And actually, you know, particularly in the time of the pandemic, you know, one of the, the um, 
not so often heard uh, recommendations that you drink a lot of water, right? You know, we, we are better able to fight off things when we are well hydrated and our systems are working effectively. So, so being able to measure that is fantastic. Um, so great work, and particularly given, given that you are uh, you now have experience in um, um, receiving sketchy devices uh, shipped across international borders. Well done. So, so <laughs> all kinds of new experiences in this project. Um, so so uh, any any last thoughts, any questions from the group? You guys are the last group. Okay. If not, then I'm going to thank you once again and call up our course assistants um, who have been really uh, behind the scenes but elemental in making this opportunity over the last two cohorts really um, something that has been valuable for the students. So I'd like to introduce um, who you see right here, Ephemeral, and then um, two people who are not yet visible to us. We have um, Nicole, whose picture is up, and Pax, whose picture is not up yet, whose video is not up yet. There is Nicole, and there is Pax. So um, I'll start with Nicole. I've known Nicole forever, so it's easy to start with Nicole. Nicole has been a, is a, is a graduate of UCSD as an undergraduate and is a, is a graduate student now. You want to you say a little bit about why you're here and, and what you're doing? Yes, hi everyone. Um, so my name is Nicole. I am a graduate student in the math and science education program. So that's joint between UC San Diego and San Diego State. Um, and because of my interest, Leanne has invited me um, to work with a, uh, this course and AIP um, in Qualcomm Institute. And so I had the pleasure of being one of the course assistants for um, last term, so fall, and then the winter term, so which is wrapping up. And so it's been an honor to watch these students and get and have them get an experience that I never got <laughs> um, um, with research and how you can apply these skills to really all aspects of academia and beyond. Wonderful, and I and I knew that uh, Nicole would be keen because she had done research in my lab when she was an undergraduate, and so I was very excited to, to bring her in. She's she's pro re pro undergraduate research, um, fantastic. Uh, and and for both ephemeral and PAGS, I had the pleasure of meeting them where I have taught for the past three years, and, and those people in the course know that we use the forum from Minerva, and we also use some some content, and I stole ephemeral impacts from there because they have a lot of experience not only teaching on this platform but using this kind of very science of learning driven method to um, instruct and I'd like them to each tell you a little bit about you know why they signed on to do this crazy thing and what it, what, it, um, what they got out of this particular experience. Uh, I'll go first. I um, so I'm ephemeral. I um, graduated as part of the first undergraduate class from Minerva Schools, uh, which meant I've spent a lot of time on the platform we used for this course and also thinking about digital learning in general. So it was exciting to kind of switch gears and work more on designing and facilitating and giving feedback. And um, so I was really excited about that aspect of like seeing a behind the scenes in a way. And I have to say this cohort in particular of this term um, has delivered some of the best undergraduate projects I've seen done on or off um, digital environments with a lot of things going on in the world. So I am just incredibly blown away by um, all of the work and the effort you put into really engaging with the material. And it was quite an honor for this to be one of my first experiences getting to do some of that designing. There we go. Um, hi guys, I'm Pax. Um, I'm slightly less cool than ephemeral in that I'm only part of the second graduate, nope, yes, second graduating class at Minerva. Um, and while I don't have a, I didn't really expect to end up getting to help you guys with through this course, but it has been a really wonderful experience because while I studied earth sciences at Minerva, I'm really interested in moving into science education and helping students like yourselves turn over really, really impressive projects. And I am entirely in agreement with Ephemeral that these are some of the 
best pro projects and presentations that I have ever seen. Um, I was just two, week, two or three weeks ago attending a ton of thesis defenses of my classmates at Minerva. And quite frankly, I think some of your guys' presentation skills on these projects are much more impressive than some of the things I saw there. And I am really proud of all of the work that you've done and cannot believe that you did it with like a pandemic happening and needing to ship equipment internationally. This is all very, very impressive. Um, and if you ever need anything in the future, um, I know you guys have our email addresses and I would love to hear from you guys if you ever want advice on doing research, if you want advice on um, designing education programs, anything like that, please reach out and let me know and I'd love to talk to you. Thank you both. Um, thank you, thank all, all three of you. You know, your, your contributions to this have been, you know, really crucial. Like, there's no way I could have done this without all of you. And I think that the students really benefited dramatically from having all your contributions. The feedback in particular, those of you who are not part of the course uh, don't know, but, but, you know, these folks actually led the grading, which meant um, not grading as in, you know, you're getting an A or you're getting, an a, you're getting a B or whatever, but like feedback, detailed feedback, not just a score, but like, hey, this wasn't quite hitting the mark because, and they did a lot of that. Um, Ephemeral and, and PAX are also, you know, really uh, um, honing their chops in instructional design, having recast a lot of the last uh, unit for this, for this second round. So um, awesome. And I think that Nicole is looking at this as a possible you know, like, hey, this is a totally different way of teaching and learning. So maybe, maybe in the future, right, this is something worth studying. So you heard it from PAX, and, and you'll hear it from me, and hopefully you also got that from me versus email. This is a community. Um, this is not the end, although this is the end of our presentations today. So please, please keep in touch. Please let us know how we can um, help you continue on your journey of research, study, and exploration. And um, yeah. Good on you. I hope you have a fantastic summer. And thank you very much for all that you've done. This is so sad. There's no like everybody like <laughs> I don't know if we're supposed to supposed to all do this, right? <laughs> this is the, the, the ASL clapping. But yes, thank you, Ayush. Anyway, take care everyone. Have a great summer. Joyce, thank you very much. Johnny, thank you very much. No problem. No, really fantastic. Aren't they amazing? It was really good. It was really, really good. I tried not to like ask questions because I feel no. like biased, but I was like, oh, I need, I need to ask if you're going to make an app. Well, <laughs> yeah, like that's up my alley. I was like, I'm going to say something.